Good evening, everybody. We're just going to wait as people come into the room as we see them emerging. Welcome. We'd like to welcome everybody today. Please go ahead and um, put a greeting following Rebecca's example there in the chat, if you'd like. We're glad to see so many friends and colleagues here to celebrate with Dr. Kim Blockett. I know she wants to know that you're here. So we are double tasking people. We have always had to do that. So feel free to do some call and response in that Q&A. Thank you, y'all. We'd love to see you there. Welcome to this Friday evening, happy hour time book party for Kim Blockett and for her wonderful memoirs of the life, religious experience, ministerial travels and labors of Mrs. Elaw. And um, we're just so glad to be here together um, to celebrate. We'd um, like to start today's event by calling into the room and naming some of those who paved the way for this work, namely Barbara Christian and Mary Helen Washington, the scholars who trained the center's co-directors, Francis Smith Foster, the barrier breaker and scholarly model for the field of 19th century print studies and Black women's literary history. And we're reminded to do that by Kimberly Blockett, who's book we are here to celebrate, to learn about, and to learn from today, and her dedication of the volume to her mentor and dissertation advisor who has inspired so many of us, um, to Nellie McKay. As we all witnessed the confirmation hearings of Kentachi Jackson Brown, we want to acknowledge just how much these Black women carried as the first in our fields often the first in their departments and in their institutions to break important barriers. We cannot say how much and how often, we cannot overstate how grateful we are to them and how much we know they had to carry um, for us to do our work with more ease or at least more compensation, but with um, quite a few challenges that continue as well. Alongside Dr. Blockett, we also want to mention William Andrews, who in his Doc South, the digital project he co-led, his book editing with graduate students, his Sisters of the Spirits, which Kim Blockett also mentions in her book, and his generosity to the field has been a mentor and a model for so many of us as well. This year, Dr. Blockett is an inaugural postdoc Mellon Just Transformation Fellow with the Center for Black Digital Research, which we fondly call Dig Black, which stands, depending on who's saying it, there's a riff, right? Depending on in whose mouth this is, love Black communities, excavate Black histories, digitize Black records. Dig Black, dig Black, right? However you'd like to pronounce it, just do it. We have three more cohorts of generously funded postdocs to welcome through the Mellon Grant. Somebody's gonna put that link um, into the chat as well. Um, and uh, at Dig Black, we're particularly looking for those interested in amassing digital archives, holding symposia and creating critical and digital editions that reflect on these people and movements. Frances Harper for her 200th anniversary in 2024, the Conventions Movement, Anna Julia Cooper and the NACW. We should note that our postdocs are avail available to folks who just finished all the way through mid-career scholars and that Kim, who is now no longer part of that cohort because she's been promoted, just slipped in. So we wanna toast to that as well. Um, we uh, also have very comprehensive five-year packages for Dig Black graduate student fellows, lots and lots of no going into debt funding, summer funding, professional development funds, moving funds, all the funds. Uh, we are really sick of folks who are under-resourced having to 
pay additional educational taxes to fund their education. So we are trying to address that here. We also have visiting pre-dissertation Big Ten fellowships. We invite you to send your students if you are a professor here to us too. Dr. Blockett has a long history with this work, with thinking with us about how to do this too. She taught our very first full class devoted to the color conventions, co-hosted the symposium, which led to a recent book. And here we are today to celebrate her book. And we will finish off after this talk with a toast too, because it's happy hour. So please make sure to get a glass of spirits to lift in celebration for a toast to Kim after this. It's my distinct pleasure to recommend, um, excuse me, to, uh, to introduce everybody um, all at once today, and then we'll get to the program itself. Um, Kimberly Blockett is my good friend and colleague and her highly anticipated work on Zilpha Elaw, who along with Jarena Lee, Julia Foote, and Rebecca Jackson is one of the most important early black women writers to address gender mobility and religious agency. Dr. Blockett's scholarship on what she calls the celebratory, so, no, I'm sorry, we're celebrating, I switched that. The celebrity memoirs of Zilpha Elaw is revelatory. It builds on significant foundations laid by scholars such as William Andrews, Joycelyn Moody, Catherine Clay Bassard, through years of transnational research, analytical acumen, and painstaking recovery that emerges from the best traditions of Black women's history and literary history and religious history. Blockett and the editors of this series, the series that the book appears in, Joycelyn Moody and John Ernest, wisely center the importance of producing editions of such strength and excellence, volumes that will be widely taught and adopted in the classroom so many of us um, teach who are in this room. And I just wanna say, right, like this, um, the ways in which we devalue editions is a tax, I think, on, on um, the work um, of scholars who are addressing the lack of this foundational work that, had, that was not done in the 80s and 90s, right? We need to value the extraordinary importance in the work, the cultural labor and the teaching and pedagogical labor that goes into producing um, uh, editions of this strength and excellence. The prose in this edition sings and soars. It makes us all hungry for the monograph, Race, Religion, and Rebellion in the 19th Century Travels of Zilpha Elaw that will soon follow upon this edition. That this work has been supported by year-long fellowships at Harvard's Divinity School and the Massachusetts Historical Society, to name just a few, speaks to the value of the groundbreaking edition we'll hear about today, not only from Dr. Blockett, but from leading and emerging scholars in Black religious history. As a colleague of hers, I also want to take a moment to say that Dr. Blockett has produced this work while she's been an institutional leader across the Penn State system, both as a division coordinator, chair of co-chair, co or co-chair of task forces and committees across 24 campuses, and now as the incoming Senate president. This is a scholar who does justice to those who paved the way for her, both in her scholarly and her, her institution building work. We know that her advisor and her mentor, Nellie McKay, could not be prouder of her as a scholar, leader, and mentor and member in the larger community to which so many of us belong. To her family who is here, we thank you for sharing her with us. The Center for Black Digital Research is delighted to be able to host this party to celebrate Dr. Blockett's and, and her work today. Denise Berger is a PhD. Oh, well, everybody say something like yes in the in the chat. You know, some uh, some some snapping and things for her. Thank you. All right. Dot Denise Berger is a PhD candidate at UD whose genealogy overlaps with those who have already been named. She's a leader in the Color Conventions Project and the Center for Black Digital Research and is co-director as a graduate student of its global transcribathon Douglas Day with Jim Casey and is the founding chair of CCP's Historic Church and Community Engagement, Engagement Committee. She joined the CCP team in 2016 when she spearheaded and led CCP's National Transcription Outreach Initiative to current AME church members whose historical de denomination and congregations hosted hundreds of early convention gatherings. 
Denise is also co-chair of the curriculum committee, which designed a standards-based CCP high school curriculum for implementation in Philadelphia schools. In 2000, and she does work on um, the murals, she didn't mention this, on the murals and the art um, that is going to debut in Philadelphia this year um, as the first uh, mural ever to appear to honor the color conventions movement. Um, in 2018-19, she was a fellow at the Library Company of Philadelphia, and her work examines literature written by Afro-Protestant African diaspora women in North America, engaging issues of gender and class-based agency, mobility, and theology. Nisha Jr., yes, she's in the room, is an associate professor in the Department of Religion at Temple University in Philadelphia on her way to the Department of Study uh, for the study of religion at the University of Toronto in July, 2022. She's the author of three groundbreaking books, including with Jeremy Shipper, Black Samson, The Untold Story of an American Icon, which was lauded as a fascinating and original contribution to scholarship at the intersections of American religious history and African-American literary studies, as well as re reimagining Hagar and an introduction to womanist biblical interpretation. And my um, homegirl and good friend, Monica Coleman, pubs some of those books too. Dr. Junior holds a PhD in Old Testament from Princeton Theological Seminary. She writes, teaches, speaks, and frequently tweets on religion, race, gender, and their intersections. Um, if you all don't follow both uh, Judith and Denise and Nisha on Twitter, please do. I'm, I might ask them to drop their Twitter handles into um, the chat. You'll learn so much. Um, from um, what they offer in that space. Her current research is on the writer and AMEC preacher, Jarena Lee. So we're gonna have Jarena Lee and Zilpha Elaw, right? Um, manuscripts and books. Um, it's about time, Ashe, amen. The prodigious, generous and generative Judith Weisenfeld is the agate. I don't know enough if I'm pronouncing this right. I'm, I'm hoping I'm getting these people's names right. Agate Brown and George, I'm gonna just turn George Colord into Collard because I like that better in this instance. The, the uh, Agate Brown and George Collard Professor of Religion and the Chair of the Department of Religion at Princeton, where she's also Associate Faculty in African-American Studies in the Program in Gender and Sexuality Studies. She is the author most recently of New World of Coming Black Religion and Racial Identity During the Great Migration, which won the 2017 Albert Rabateau Prize for the best book in Africana religions. And I think we also just want to honor um, Rabateau, whose passing also has been recent um, and, and whose work has paved the way for so much of what we'll discuss today. Um, she is also the author of Hollywood Be Thy Name, African-American Religion and, and American Film, 1929 to 49 as well as African-American women and Christian activism, New York's Black WCA, 1905 to 1945. Her current research focuses on psychiatry, race and Black religions in the late 19th and early 20th, and early 20th US. And she is century US. And she's the editor of the journal, Religion and American Culture. Take notes, y'all. This is what a career is supposed to look like, right? Okay. so that she's the editor of the Journal of Religion and American Culture on the editorial boards of the Journal of Africana Religions and American Religion. She is an elected member of the Society of American Historians and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the highest scholarly honor and a place to which few black women have ascended. She's also an organization of American Historians Distinguished Lecture. She's a standard bearer and we're so, so delighted to have you here with us today, Judith. So let's get started with Kim Blockett, who will um, speak for 15 minutes, followed by Denise. We're gonna go in junior order. That's what we tend to do at the at Dig Black. And then Nisha and Judith before opening up for Q and A. Kim, we're so happy to hear your voice and have you here. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, I just want to add my deep and sincere thanks um, to the, the Center for Black Digital Research, certainly uh, Gabrielle Foreman and Shirley Moody Turner, the co-directors, but also uh, very specifically uh, to uh, Gabby and Daphne, 
who have just been on the ground doing the hard work. And then I just met Kevin today. So, you know, a lot of folks um, dug in to pull, put, pull this all together so that I literally just had to like show up. And I, <laughs> I just, I'm so grateful. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm, I'm just gonna try and breeze through uh, a quick uh, overview of, of ELAW and how I came to, to work on ELAW and, and then open it up because I really wanna get to discussion with these uh, fabulous scholars. So understanding that there will be lots of questions um, from the audience because I'm, you know, I, know, I know some of you are just coming to ELAW and this is really gonna be brief. And so you'll have questions and, and I welcome them. Um, so, uh, first of all, um, you know, I just wanted to speak to why ELAW, right? Wh why did I um, really spend uh, a good amount of time uh, unearthing her life and work, um, and it, that work ended up uh, in, this, in this edition? And, um, and then secondly, why this particular woman's history matters. And this edition that came that is is come out, and as Gabrielle mentioned, uh, my monograph my book on Elaw is coming out later. Um, the edition was almost an afterthought. It came from this change of focus as a scholar for me. Um, it, the, originally, um, I only had you know one book in mind, the, the typical monograph that that academics do, um, and. Just starting this work on ELA just really changed my trajectory. So it started, um, as, as Gabrielle mentioned earlier, with my dissertation director, Nellie McKay. Um, I was focused on early 20th century modernist work, and I was very interested in Black women and travel and what uh, travel meant for Black women and then what it meant for the cultures and the context through which they traveled. And she said, you know, you really need to look at uh, Zilpha ELA. And I said, Zilpha who? Um, no, thank you. That's not my jam. I'm, I'm not 19th century. At, eh. um, and she was persistent. And as usual, she was right. So after reading uh, the, the spiritual autobiography and seeing that it did indeed fit very firmly uh, into my, my subject matter, because I had not uh, done this work before, the time that I had to spend to do the research necessary to write one chapter, one Zilpha Elaw, because I needed to have a better understanding of Black life in the 19th century. I needed to have a better understanding of religion and uh, Protest specifically Protestantism and Methodism um, in the 19th century. And I needed to have a much uh, deeper uh, understanding of, of women's work during this period. So all that it took to bring that chapter together by the time I was done, I had changed my entire focus as a scholar because I was so curious about this woman and what she was doing um, in this period. Um, and so that um, work that I did, it ended up uh, being a lot of recovery work uh, because once I finished that and then uh, informed Nellie uh, who had by then moved from being my dissertation director to my mentor in my career. And I said, well, you know, I really want to write a book on ELAW. And she had a very, she was pleased, but she had a very important question, which was, um, are you sure? I mean, we have this one narrative and we don't know much about her. Are you sure you actually have enough to write a whole book um, on ELAW? That was an important question because it helped me to understand that no, I thought I did, but I actually didn't. And I needed to jump into this recovery. And the recovery work ended up being the discovery, right? The discovery of the full breadth of her itinerant ministry, which is so much larger than what we know about from what she wrote in her narrative. Um, coming to understand, actually putting a context to her travel so I was interested in her because she was a traveler and also to be fair, because she was a rule breaker, right? She was, she was preaching in a time when women weren't supposed to be preaching. Um, and she was in direct uh, defiance of both her, her minister and her husband and just people at large who were saying, you know, women shouldn't be preaching. And there were lots of women who were doing, who were preaching because they, 
women do things that people tell them that they're not supposed to be doing. And I thought that was really um, something that was worth looking at. And so looking at the context of those travels, so, you know, what was happening when she went from place to place? What did that each place mean? So that kind of mapping um, took me deeper and deeper. Um, and then fundamentally, um, by the time I finished that discovery process, I really then began to understand that there, were, there was a work that needed to be done to right a wrong. And I'll say a little bit um, more about that later. Um, so the travels, I just wanted to give people a sense of the extent of this ministry, right? So the first uh, 20 years or so, um, she was preaching uh, in, uh, in, the, in basically the eastern seaboard of the United States, as far north as Maine, as far south as Virginia. And then the last 25 years of her career, she preached all over England. And so what you see in these maps are all the places that I've been able to document through either she mentions it in her narrative, and then I confirmed it through records, and then also through combing through newspaper announcements and letters of other people, um, other places um, for the last 25 years of her career. So that's all on these maps. Um, and then ultimately, by the end of it, I came to understand that she was most likely the first Black woman preacher in the Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, she, as we knew, she was itinerant, but as I said before, we didn't understand the scope of it. Um, we knew from her narrative that she did two trips uh, into the South from between 1820 and 1840. I wanted to put a lot more context on those trips and get a lot more information about what was happening. And then we knew that she went to England in 1840 and then her narrative ends in 1845 when she says she's about to come back to the United States. And that's sort of the end of our, the extent of our knowledge as scholars of her life and her work. And then that's where I sort of picked up to flesh out the fact that she actually stayed, I believe she stayed in England, but what I know is that she was back in England if she ever left. Um, by 1847, um, and she preached into the 1860s, mid-1860s, and that while she was there, she reached celebrity status, and by that I mean there were lots of newspaper accounts of uh, times when there were human stampedes uh, for her preaching, and people were injured. Um, there were some deaths recorded at times, and there are also a lot of instances uh, reported in newspapers where folks complained about either the venue needed to be changed because it, the venue was too small for the number of people who showed up, or what happened uh, most more often is that people were turned away um, and would complain about it and it would get reported um, in the press. And then after a long uh, celebrated career, she died in London in 1873. She was poor and primarily unacknowledged for her contributions to Methodism in England, which at that point was the largest Protestant denomination of the period. So she literally wrote herself uh, into the historical record, right? Because we have her narrative. And she seemed to be aware of the fact that she needed to do that. Um, and she ends her narrative saying, these humble memoirs will doubtless continue to be read long after I shall have ceased from my earthly labors and existence. Um, and that to me was is such an, it was an incredible statement because after doing again, all of this archival work, it became very clear to me that had she not done that, we would not know about um, about Elaw and certainly not about the about the extent of her ministry. And so I talked um, about uh, just that recovery and discovery uh, process. And then finally, as I mentioned before, I, I felt that I needed to right a wrong. And by that I mean by the time I got to the end of this journey or 
I'm not going to say the end. By the time I got to the end of this edition, <laughs> putting this piece together, um, I realized that this really had turned into a project around justice. Um, and the justice piece being uh, that this woman had died in obscurity. And then what she left us was this uh, narrative, which still doesn't even begin to give us the story of her import. And I began to realize that in this uh, lovely place, the Methodist Archives Research Center uh, in Manchester, and it was about as welcoming as it looks. And I've spent a lot of time there over the years. Um, and what I was doing was going through hundreds of handwritten journals um, because the fortunately uh, Methodists were meticulous about recording their meetings and their history and, and how, how Methodism was working in England, right? The, the nitty gritty of what um, ministers and congregations were doing. And a, a, a good majority of it is in this building. So I'm going through hundreds of these handwritten journals looking for evidence of her. And at some point I find it, but the only reason I was able to find it is that she had mentioned two white men in her narrative once she mentions them. And after years of trying to find information about Elaw, by then I had figured out that I needed to work backwards from the white people who she mentioned and go into their records in order to find her. Um, because the challenges of finding a black woman in the 1820s through 1860s on her own merits was undaunting and almost impossible. So you'll note here that this uh, minister, John Colson, who she mentions once in her narrative, um, is being sanctioned because he has unconstitutionally employed a certain black preacher woman. Um, and this comes up uh, in the district um, meeting minutes and they've sanctioned him. And then I found several instances where she's mentioned, here's another where another minister who's the superintendent of the circuit, also without the circuit's consent, um, employed the black woman. What's notable about this is that it was, I was able to, it jumped out at me uh, because in those hundreds of handwritten journals, each journal being over a hundred pages itself, not in any other circumstance, was there anything in all caps and underlined ever? Um, and these were written by, you know, all kinds of people, again, over a 40 year period. So this, we're not talking about one person writing all these things. Um, and in these journals, when she is mentioned, she is never named. She is only ever referred to as the black woman or that black woman. And so at this point, this became a project for me of justice. Another more current example. Um, this is a slide, I was doing some research, trying to find out, um, I don't know what I was looking for at this point, but I came across this slide, it was a lecture um, given by a dean of a, of a prestigious um, uh, school of theology. And note several things here. So his, his lecture included quite a bit about ELAW. Um, the date, 1792 to 1845, both are incorrect. We don't have a date for her birth. My guess, my best guess has been 1793, but you would have to acknowledge that that's a guess. It's not definitive. And then 1845, she certainly didn't die in 1845. Um, but what's most striking is that's not Zilpha Elaw. <laughs> and not only is it not Zilpha Elaw, I can forgive someone not knowing that that's not a picture of her because we didn't really have pictures of her readily available. But this is a pretty famous picture of a pretty famous person. So it should have been recognizable um, that this is Sojourner Truth because we have plenty of pictures of her and this is a sort of an iconic picture of her. Um, and so... All of these things come together for me to say, okay, enough is enough. Um, let me do this work. Um, 
and right this wrong um, that ends with one of the last finds was me trying to figure out where was she, where is she, where where was she buried? I knew that she died there. There was a record of it, um, and it turns out that she um, is in an unmarked grave because she was in a a group plot, which means that there she was buried in a uh, plot with about uh, seven to eight unrelated random people. Um, and it's it's not mapped. So it's impossible to know where she is in this cemetery, which is now um, a park. Um, and, and and it's not it's you you can't find her. You just know that she's there somewhere. Um, and so these are the kinds of things um, that have propelled the work, that have sustained the work, um, and that led to the addition, right? Because as it turns out, um, to Nellie's question, I not only had enough to say about her for one book, it I had enough to say about her for two different books. I began to understand that, you know, we needed to have this classroom edition. Um, so my hope is that this edition provides what we will need in order to have more nuanced and informed discussions of ELA and the full impact of her ministry, both in her lifetime and what it means to us now as scholars of history and culture. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, and now we'll hear from our um, three fabulous panelists and go to Q&A before we hand this back over to Shirley Moody Turner, the co-director of the Center for Black Digital Research. Denise. Thank you so much. Dr. Foreman, and thank you very much, Dr. Blackett. Everybody will excuse my, my nervousness. I am, all of these women are doing the kind of scholarship that I am aspiring to produce. Um, and so this very generous offer to invite me to this table um, is both um, terrifying and inspiring. So I'm trying to, trying to get there. All right. So Dr. Blockett opened the introduction to her critical edition of Zilpha Elaw's memoir with two British 19th century newspaper excerpts which describe Zilpha Elaw Shum's public reception at two respective preaching events. These texts locate Elaw in England, identify her gender and color and the reason for her appearance while chronicling the spectacular and indeed disruptive nature of her presence. Vivid depictions of people being crushed and injured in their anticipation of Elaw's sermon and the still more pointed description of the preaching event as Barnum-like convey shock, filtered confusion and disapproval, heralding to the reader that this woman will not conform to expected patterns. But is there an expected pattern for a black woman? As a work of recovery, Dr. Blackett is not simply correcting an existing narrative. She has written a new story, the story of Zilpha Elaw Shum, who was a wildly popular black woman preacher and teacher and American and English Methodism during the waning years of the Second Great Awakening, making her not just one of its historians, but a powerful shaper of Methodism and Protestantism in the Atlantic world. To contextualize Ela Shum's life as a transatlantic Black woman evangelist, Dr. Blockett's meticulous research took her, as she is just described, into the records of white primitive Methodist and Christian churches in England. Interestingly, as she's already said, she found Ela Shum in church journals, not by finding her name, but physical descriptions of the black woman. Corresponding those entries with dates and locations of Elah's publicized preaching, Dr. Blockett uncovered evidence of Elah Shum's suppression in the record, not her presence. Said another way, Dr. Blockett found Elah Shum's erasure, her presence in absence from these archives. Dr. Blockett makes significant interventions in existing historic nar narratives of Protestantism, Black religion, the Great Awakenings in the US and England and women's religious history. By locating Elah Shum in Protestant networks as a popular preacher whose voice called untold numbers unto repentance and into the folds of organized Protestant churches, Dr. Blockett identifies Elah Shum as a crucial leader and shaper of transatlantic Methodism at a critical juncture in the evolution of the dominant denominations of Methodism and of the Baptists. One of my favorite parts of this critical edition is the timeline. The timeline literally embeds Elah Shum into the histories of women's ministries and US Black Protestantism. 
Said another way, Dr. Blockett not only writes Ela Shem's history from a Black feminist perspective, but she recreates the structure of the broader discourse by demonstrating where Ela Shem already was and should be, thereby revealing the gaps in existing histories while revealing the existing debilities of the discourse. Blockett locates Ela Shem in a variety of Black networks. As a result of her careful research, we now know that Ela was born in an activist Quaker network within a free Black community, that she lived in activist Black networks in Bucks County, Burlington County, New Jersey, and later still Nantucket before moving to England. In these spaces, Ela would have experienced a deep grounding in Black Christianity and a freedom and access not just to education, but social and political expression and personal development. These settings, as Dr. Blockett states, influenced E-Law and contributed to what we experienced as her exceptionalism. I would further suggest that e was a product of these varied Black communities within which she was an individual. Therefore, she was an expression of who they were as a community. Knowing how Black people are marginalized and silenced in archives and histories in general and Black women specifically, combined with what Dr. Blockett has revealed i.e. the deliberate erasure of Black holy women from church records, I further suggest that what we think we know about Black women and Black communities during this time period is far less than we've begun to imagine. Dr. Blockett's reading and writing of Ela Shum's history establishes space for my own work, which seeks to situate Black Afro-Protestant 19th century women writers like Ela, like Jarena Lee, Amanda Berry Smith, and including Mariah Stewart, among others, as theologians. I theorize that these women wrote an embodied proto-womanist theology, anchored and informed by their experiences with God through the Holy Spirit, grounded in Black community and the Black church in conversation with the Christian white church and latitudinarian American culture. Said more simply, the religious texts written by Afro-Protestant women are theology. Like Elaw, her sister holy women lived unconventional lives and wrote about the evolution of their faith, declaring that the untraveled paths that they each took were called, created, and ordained by the Holy Spirit. These women simultaneously navigated multiple tensions in different readers in their spiritual autobiographies using language frames and references in which are the principles and concepts of proto-womanism. I map the ways that during the Second Great Awakening, Black Christianity grew out of Black community, deeply informed by African cosmologies under the direction of the Holy Spirit, which Afro-Protestant holy women embraced and followed. Evolving from multiple Black networks, early Black Christianity embraced a radical form of gender equity in spiritual practice that was both consistent with West African spiritual practices and with the unfettered expressions of charismatic Black Christianity, which at that time was deeply spirit-driven in which Afro-Protestant holy women were not exceptions and were more numerous than we knew. It is significant that Ela Shum's confirmation of her English ministry came through the mouth of her sister, embedded in Black community as she crossed through a thin space into eternity, and that Ela saw herself as a minister bringing back to England the spirit which animated that country during its religious revivals before crossing its borders and flowing into America. Afro-Protestant holy women wrote and lived during a between time, particularly for the new light denominations of Baptists and Methodists, which saw the manifestation of Black Christianity before the palling power of respectability and its required adherence to the societal and cultural norms of white latitudinarian Christianity and their subsequent slip into individualistic conformity and strident misogyny, which I argue quenched the spirit. During this time, Afro-Protestant women like Elaw blazed trails of liberation and faith, unencumbered by the dictates of race and gender by embracing their blackness and womanhood and capitalizing on the prescriptions of the same to explode their anti-Christian intersectional constraints. By establishing Ela Shum so firmly in black activist networks and tracking her missionary and evangelistic activities, especially in England where she lived and spent the final years of her life, Elaw's text in this critical edition can be read as a theological exposition of the Holy Spirit. Dr. Blockett places Elaw Shum in her context as a Black woman historian of the Second Great Awakening and as one of the women preachers in the 19th century working and living in America and England, and as a consequence, one of the architects and arbiters of Methodism in America and England. Building directly on Dr. Blockett's work, I hope I will demonstrate that Zilpha Elah Shum 
was one of the greatest theologians of Afro-Protestantism in the 19th century. Thank you so much, the future Dr. Berger. We're looking forward to that work. Dr. Junior. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. Um, I'm delighted to be able to celebrate this beautiful book. I sent the invitation to one of my colleagues who's a black woman. And she said that she rarely sees so many black women on a flyer unless it's for a church event. So I'm glad to be here with you today. In my own research on Jarena Lee, I'm finding that her work still resonates with so many women, especially women preachers, especially women preachers who've had difficulty in becoming ordained or in being acknowledged within their denominational leadership. So I'm wondering how have your students and others responded to Elaw's story and are there particular elements of her story that they find resonance with? You're ready to launch us into questions, huh, Dr. Junior? <laughs> this is how I understood the assignment. So. Okay, all right, hold up. I'm gonna come back to you to start in a minute, okay? Okay. All right, Dr. Weisenfeld. Thank you. I'm so honored to have been invited to participate in this um, celebration of the publication of Dr. Blockett's new critical edition of Zilpha Elaw's memoirs. I first read Memoirs of the Life, Religious Experience, Ministerial Travels, and Labors of Mrs. Elaw in graduate school in a course with Albert Rabateau, who was my advisor probably just a few years after William Andrews included it in the amazing collection, Sisters of the Spirit. I have my um, beaten up copy right here, much read. Um, I have read and taught it many times since then in courses on African-American religious history and on Black women's religious experiences. And my experience of Elaw's memoir has undoubtedly been shaped by its placement in Andrew's book between Jarena Lee's The Life and Religious Experiences of Jarena Lee and Julia Foote's A Brand Plucked from the Fire. These are similar spiritual narratives to Elaw's and Andrew's introduction is, is just such a wonderful um, a, a tool for thinking about these together. So they're similar to Elaw's. They emphasize conversion, sanctification, call to preach, opposition to preaching, itinerancy, and success in evangelizing. And in truth, I and my students have always been more drawn to the other two narratives. They're shorter, easier to teach in that way. Um, they're more pointed in making arguments about the relationship among theology, gender, and preaching. And they offer insight into the development of the black denominations of the African Methodist Episcopal Church and the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. How much more drama can you have of like Jarena Lee and Richard Allen? Um, there are moments in Elaw's narrative when she talks about religion and race that present interpretive challenges when one teaches this as well, um, as when she talks about slavery, an enslaved brother's impatience towards slavery and his and her direction of his towards his reward in heaven, right? In a way that I think recalls Jupiter Hammond's earlier um, address to the Negroes of the state of New York. And the vision she has in which she sees God and tens of thousands of others clothed in white. And she writes, my own complexion and raiment were also white. And so for various reasons, Lee's and Foote's narratives have been more legible, I think, and, and easier to teach. So to say that Dr. Blockett's edition of Elaw's memoirs has transformed my view of the text is, is an understatement. And not simply because it sits alone in this volume as it, as it should, right? Um, shining a spotlight on Elaw's travels and religious labors in the early 19th century Atlantic world. And, and I, the maps are, are, you saw them so illuminating the timeline. Um, uh, this edition attends carefully to the contours and goals of the genre of spiritual narrative, which subordinates biography to account of spiritual transformation 
And it also recovers such fascinating biographical detail that renders Ela a much fuller and more real black woman committed to spreading the gospel. And most particularly the remarkable research Dr. Blockett has done to flesh out Ela's life in England before and after the publication of the memoirs and her analysis of Ela's participation in the great Second Great Awakening and engagements with Br British Methodists call on us to view Ela as a figure who contributed to and shaped right, transatlantic Methodism in ways that so many people sought to erase. In the final paragraph of, of the memoirs, Ela writes, and you saw this on one of the slides, she writes with a characteristic confidence, these humble memoirs will doubtless continue to be read long after I shall have ceased from my earthly labors and existence, but it's really Dr. Blockett's labors now that have ensured this. Um, I want to highlight just quickly two keywords in, Blo in Dr. Blockett's analysis and pose questions from these. Um, first, chosen is a keyword in the analysis of Ela's life, especially around place of residence. And you write Nantucket, Nantucket was her chosen home. She chose to go to England. She chose to stay. Um, but I think it also refers, you refer at times to her chosen vocation. Um, I'm interested just in your thoughts as a kind of problem for for writing and teaching um, that I think my colleagues here may uh, encounter as well. I'm interested in your thoughts on the challenges of writing about someone who interprets her actions as motivated and enabled by something other than choice. Right? Elaw writes repeatedly, this is the will of God. Um, and so this may be a question toward the biography or the, the, the monograph you have, but here um, in your, I'm just thinking about it, uh, how, you, how you think about that question of agency and divine, or her agency and divine agency in, in this text. And finally, the second word um, keyword is expansive. And you use this term several times on one page, actually, um, in talking about the expanse of her ministry, noting that, quote, her non-affiliation with the black churches expanded her purview, end quote. And here you mean, of course, that membership in the Methodist Episcopal Church connected her to broader geographical networks that expanded the places she could go and the number of people to whom she could preach. But there's a way in which purview here could also be read to signal that her non-affiliation with black churches, the black churches expanded her theological and intellectual world um, in some way. And I'd like to hear more about your thinking on this. And this connects to um, something that Denise was talking about as well. I'm so struck by the account Elaw gives it's on page 34 of being at a camp meeting after an illness with the black participants segregated into their own tent and they attract the attention of presumably the white participants because of their the fervent prayer, the quote mingling of so many voices and of such various tones of sorrow and rejoicing, of despair and exultation, of prayer and praise. Hundreds were attracted to the place, end quote. And someone in the tent complains about all these other people coming in and she says, quote, let them come in and see the wonderful works of God, end quote. And it's just after that that she hears a voice and receives a commission to preach his holy gospel. So she narrates the inauguration of her work as an ambassador for Christ, not from a black church, but from a gathering of black Christians. And I wonder about your thoughts on her orientation towards something we might call black religion. Again, that, that connects to... Um, things that Denise was talking about. So again, thank you for this gift. Um, and I look forward to your monograph on ELA. Thank you for that. Um, I'm not sure where to start. Um, I think, let me, let me backtrack, I think, to, um, to the question about engagement with students. Um, which is a difficult question <laughs> um, for me. Um, so um, I, it, it sort of run the gamut in terms of um, how the reception, right? And I think this this also um, speaks to um, to to do this point around um, how how we how we receive right um, the original narrative. And then now moving uh, to the edition, I found the narrative um, 
to be very challenging to teach. And I've had excellent experiences teaching it, but that has a lot to do with context. So one ex excellent experience being um, in a course about Black women's movement, um, and that was at um, University of Pennsylvania. And then the other um, teaching a course about Black women's movement and spirituality at the Harvard Divinity School. So I think it speaks volumes that those were the only two courses that I've taught where I've spent a lot of time on ELAR or any time at all, and I count them as successful, <laughs> successful engagement. Um, and by successful, I mean um, broad interest and openness to actually uh, doing a deep dive into, into the narrative. And, and the, the other uh, experiences teaching it have been in a couple of undergraduate courses where I, it was less successful. And I, I say less successful because those students were less willing um, to engage and much more narrow in their reception of her narrative. Um, and I, I haven't really, after that point, I never made much attempt to teach it. And that was another thing that drove the addition was I felt that we didn't have enough information to actually teach this text well, because it doesn't sort of jump into the, there are some texts we know as teachers that you look, pick them up and automatically they just scream to be taught. <laughs> but, you know, they do all the things. Um, and this isn't a text that does that immediately. It's not immediately clear how it's meeting all those markers of a quote unquote, very teachable text. Um, and so my hope is that the context that's provided in the edition will help to solve that problem. Um, that the, this hopefully is much more teachable because we have more information. I hope that answers your question about student engagement. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Blockett, you wanna to go to some keywords? Yes, how about it? Keywords, um, <laughs> chosen. So um, I've been challenged on my, my conversation around ELA's chosen um, homes. And, um, and I've thought about it a lot. And at this point, I, I may change my mind as I learn more, but at this point, I'm gonna stick with that word chosen. Um, and here's why. Um, first, a lot of it has to do with my reception and my approach um, to, to the narrative, which began with a rhetorical analysis because I'm trained as a literary scholar, right? And so, um, I was very interested in the ways that she, she narrates very differently about her different locations and sort of looking at the language that she uses to talk about those locations um, in terms of defining what is, what is she choosing for herself. Um, I also came to it with a, uh, a literary studies, I guess, based skepticism of again the rhetoric that she's she's writing within a genre and she does an excellent job because she was well educated <laughs> of writing within that genre and so I automatically from that training um, in question well what wasn't there or what did she say in certain ways because she had to meet the the restrictions of that genre right and so so my reading then of her um, insistence that, oh, well, I went here um, and, I, and, and, and I probably shouldn't have gone here, but I did because that's what I was told to do by God, or I'm doing this because that, that's what I was told to do by God. I accept that as that is her faith and her calling, um, but there's agency within movement and decisions, right? So to give a specific example, she had started preaching um, in, um, in, in, when she was living in, Bur in Burlington, New Jersey. And she was seemed to be having a fairly successful career. And she was also preaching at camp meetings, which involved some travel. 
Um, and she talked about really, you know, enjoying the work of, of doing that lay ministry. Um, and so she could have chosen to continue in that path, right? To stay there and do what she was doing. Um, and so I questioned, well, what moved her to, to expand that, right? What moved her to, to leave um, New Jersey and to, and to move forward? And so how she defined itinerancy, it seems to me um, that, was, that was her choice. Um, and then also when she, she did things like, um, you know, she would, in, in her narrative, she would say, you know, I went here, I went there, I went there, and it reads almost like a travel log. Uh, but then once I started getting um, some outside context, for instance, a letter that she wrote, um, she narrates something as, I think she put, talked about it for like two or three sentences, um, but then she writes a letter that's not in her narrative, right? So clearly that's narrative choice. And she talks about that decision very differently. She talks about in the letter, the fact that she changed her mind, right? And she wanted to, she, she had to think about who she was as a black woman. And in this instance, she was privileging the black part, you know, her, that piece of her identity um, over wanting to assert herself as a theological authority, right? When she's having conversations with these, you know, sort of high and mighty men um, in, in England who were wanting her to come and speak as, um, speak to, to, to anti-slavery, Right, they wanted her to speak in the vein of uh, almost fug fugitivity, which she was not, and she refused. Right, but then in the letter, so that's in the narrative she refuses. But in the letter that she writes the very next morning um, to the the people who had given that request, um, she, you know, she she says she she wants to revisit that decision, and ask for another opportunity to speak for her people. So that's where I find the decision-making, the agency, the places where she is absolutely guided by the spirit, but she makes her own decisions around how that manifests itself um, in every location that she's in and in every encounter that she has an engagement. Dr. Foreman, if possible, if I could build on that, Dr. Blackett. Please. So I had, okay, thanks. I completely agree with you. And that was part of what was so exciting about reading this critical edition, because as I have spent a lot of time reading through her memoir and, and, the, and the other writings of these Afro-Protestant holy women, everything that you're saying really resonates with me. And I didn't have... I have not done your research, but reading about those moments of dissonance, I was like, exactly. And the care that she took to identify for those who were able to understand what she was writing, the networks of Black communities that she was actually coming out of. So building on that, in Reckoning with Slavery, historian Jennifer Morgan writes, there's little in the way of situating enslaved women of African descent at the heart of a process of knowledge production of crafting meaning out of the structures of value in which they were embedded and thus which they became part of defining, end quote. So if we think of Elaw as a knowledge producer, in addition to writing a first person history of the great, awake, of the great, awake, of the great awakening, what do you think Elaw offers us as readers and scholars in her text by way of knowledge production? Um, at this juncture, I know you're gonna write the monograph which I cannot wait to read, but, but Ela as a knowledge producer, not just someone who history is acting on um, and affecting, but someone who is, as a critical thinking Black woman in her time, who is then choosing to write this text, what, what can we glean from this text by way of her theorizing, her production of knowledge as a critical thinker? Thanks for that question. Um, I am really interested in, um, and, and, and I do a lot of this in the, in, the, in the book, in the forthcoming book, but I want to see a long trajectory of scholarship around this. I'm very interested in the cultural work 
uh, that is happening from her itinerancy, right? So in terms of knowledge production, every single time she went to a different small town in England, because her ministry in England was primarily in very small rural uh, Northern England towns, right? And where a lot of these folks had little to no interaction with any people of color, let alone um, a, a free black woman from, from the US. And so just literally going to that town um, and then going as a, a religious authority, right? So she's, she's black, she's a woman, and she's going in a position of authority to care for, right? To care for the spirits of the folks who are there. And she was very clear what she was there to do. And most of the time her audience was not as clear, right? Why she was there, how did she get here? Who is she and why, why does she think she has the whatevers? You know, what, what she, does she have this? Uh, why does she have the goods, right? What, what new thing can she tell us um, about, um, about Jesus Christ? Right. So and, the, and a lot of them were very skeptical. And so she talks about in her narrative the ways in which uh, many of the folks who would come and show up in those crowds were there uh, to sort of see her as a spectacle. Sometimes they were there to ridicule her. Sometimes they were there to do physical harm to her. Right. To stone her. Um, and so every time she showed up, she was producing knowledge because she was forcing everyone in that audience, even those who were welcoming her, um, to reconfigure and rethink about, about their, their own theology and the way that they, they practice um, and their belief system and how this person might have something to say to them, right? About her ability to actually preach from the text, right? So even though she pre preached as most Methodist ministers did extemporaneously, um, she always she always was preaching from a text. And that's a really important distinction, right? For all lay ministers of the period, particularly women, uh, because, and particularly Methodists, because many were uneducated. So that's the other thing is, nine times out of 10 in the locations that she's preaching, um, she's often probably the most educated person in the space. And, and, and that's kind of something, <laughs> right? Um, and so she, she's forcing a reckoning with how it is that they envision American blackness right? How it is that they envision womanhood and how it is that they envision um, how, how theology gets practiced, right? How um, worship can be thought of differently or taught or talked about differently. Um, and most importantly, from a different source. So that's, I think, my primary thing I would say about her, her knowledge production and in, in, in the sense of the cultural work that she did moving from place to place to place. And not only was she asking them to think more deeply about their, theolo their, their theological practice, but they also were forced then to, to think more deeply about race, right? Um, and gender. Dr. Junior. We were wondering if you wanted to ask um, any other questions or um, synthesize any of what you've heard. Yes. So um, Black woman archivist Sierra King uses the hashtag build your archive. And she knows that usually for Black folks, their work, if it is preserved at all, is archived only after they are dead and gone. So when we think about knowledge production, when we think about Ila as a writer and as someone who is chronicling her journey, what do you have to say today to Black artists, writers, and even academics about the importance of documenting, preserving, and even archiving their work? 
Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, that you, you've said it, build your archive. As someone who had had to go searching for bits and pieces and scraps and this, that, and the other, um, and and I I I live daily with the the I don't know what to call it the regret the the wonder the all of it that if she was there and her daughter was there as in England and her daughter for so many years right was um, lived in Nantucket um, there had to have been a ton of letter writing. She was very, she had one child, right? And what I wouldn't give <laughs> to have those letters. And, you know, maybe, uh, maybe I'll come across them at some point, but as it, it's, it feels unlikely um, because it, of the difficulty, right? Of finding historical record of black life because records weren't kept. And even if someone tried to keep records, often just because of the material uh, circumstances, right, of any, any church, right, where they might, Black churches, where they might have records, Black families, um, you know, if, if the material circumstances of a family might mean that lo uh, lots of material culture is lost, letters aren't kept moving from place to place. Um, so I can't say enough about the importance <laughs> of record keeping and, and archiving um, as a, a daily um, individual and family practice and group practice, um, it, it particularly for, for us, for Black folk, for any underrepresented groups, because if we don't keep our records, <laughs> we can't, you know, th there, there is an infrastructure it doesn't exist, right? It's starting to be built, but there is, it doesn't exist to be able to adequately archive and catalog and, and resource um, all the things that we would want to have access to in order to appropriately study um, a black, black life, particularly in earlier periods. So just keep everything. <laughs> I hate to contribute to, you know, hoarding and whatnot, but <laughs> we have to record, we have to record our experiences in our life. Any other questions from this wonderful group? Did you want to follow up, Dr. Junior? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just saying thank you very much for that response. All right. Should we go to Q&A? I think Shirley Moody Turner is going to take us there. Um, and then also lead us in the toast. So here is Dr. Moody Turner. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all of these um, brilliant presentations and comments. Um, so we have uh, some questions coming in to the Q and A in the chat. And your first one is from your uh, scholar sister, uh, Shanna Benjamin, who writes, uh, thank you for this simply outstanding presentation, Dr. Blockett. I know that researching and writing this book required you to travel quite a bit. How did your movement, how did your travels deepen or enrich your understanding of the itinerant nature of Elaw's life? Oh, thank you for that excellent question. Um, because that was one of the things that I hadn't thought about, right? Because we just do the do the work, so just jump in. Um, and it it really wasn't until I had been traveling, I don't know, maybe about four or five years to various places, particularly back and forth to London um, and to Manchester, that I really started to um, put two and two together uh, and, and begin to understand that a lot of the struggles um, that I was uh, encountering uh, moving through different places as a Black woman, um, that I needed to think about them in terms of the context of, oh, wow, uh, if this is tough for me now, <laughs> you know, what was this like for her? For her, that was, you know, that was the first time that I sort of started looking at after uh, being really worn out by a, a trip to London and then getting there and it was cold and rainy and I didn't, it was July and I had to buy a winter coat while I was there and then I was upset because it was so expensive and I didn't have a lot of money and then I had to figure out how to get to Manchester. 
that's when I started doing research on how long did travel actually take to get from place to place and started paying much closer attention to how she was traveling and learning way more than anybody should know about the difference between a packet ship and a steamship and <laughs> um, uh, blanking on the, um, the other kind of ship that she was traveling by. Um, and so it, my own experiences helped me to dig deeper into what the actual physical travel must have been like for her and to pay much closer attention to the way that she either wrote about it or didn't write about it um, in her narrative and to, to, to think through, again, some of the rhetorical decisions that she made around talking about that movement. Um, and, and she did it quite a bit in ways that I had kind of overlooked uh, before starting to do all this travel myself. And then I went back to it again, you know, to look at well, what did she say about this movement from here to here? And, you know, how much did she talk about the, the physicality of it and, and the danger? And it turns out she spends a good amount of time talking about just the physical uh, wear and tear on her body, right? Which was um, a, a mainstay in some ways of the the journals and the and the narratives of um, Methodist ministers. Um, it, it's part of what they would write about, right? The wear and tear on their bodies as itinerant ministers, and then to think about that in terms of right, and then add on to what these white male ministers are writing about and then add the layers right of of marginality onto that as we talk about elaw traveling so from that all of that travel there became i think a closer connection of with that i had with elaw and thinking through whatever i was doing whatever i was uh encountering right? I would think about, hmm, so what would the, this have been like in 1852 in this moment? And then look at, you know, look, start looking at the context. Um, so it was, um, the, the traveling around was uh, critical. And one of the things that I'd love to do in my spare time, and I started doing a little bit of this and doing my research, is to actually hit every place that she went. Um, and, you know, that, who knows when that's going to happen, but I've gotten probably to about a third of the places that she went. Thank you. Um, and thank you for sharing your, your strategy and your method and what it means to, to do this work in ways that are really, you know, so deeply uh, meaningful and just challenge so many of the, the conventions for how we think about travel um, as something that's not you know, what does it mean to be a Black woman traveling and how is that really an embodied experience? Um, so you there's a question from uh, Charles Blockett who would like to know, Dr. Blockett, tell us how you found Miss Elaw's picture. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, how did I find the, the picture? Um, I was looking uh, between two uh, primary, so her, there, there were two libraries, the British Library and of course the Library of Congress um, who had a, a, an, an original manuscript. And I had been working primarily from the British Library um, version. And um, there were references to um, a frontispiece, which would be the picture, right? Um, of the author, but I couldn't find an actual picture. So I, I knew that one existed. And then when things started getting digitized, um, someone came up with, with a picture and I assumed that that picture was in the, Brit the British Library um, uh, copy. And, and then just when I decided, okay, I actually have time to go back and look for this and whatever, then COVID hit. And I was trying to, to figure that all out. Um, and then at some point I, I was able to get a Zoom appointment um, in this, with the special collections person at the British Library. Um, and was so happy because I thought, finally, I'm gonna get a, a copy of this picture. I'm gonna see it and get it. 
And they had done the research ahead of time and they told me, well, there's no picture. And I'm like, no, that can't be right. So the, the guy puts it on a camera and you can see it from, a, you know, technology is a wonderful thing in these moments. Um, and in there, it, it wasn't there. So I'm like, okay, I know there's a picture, where's the picture? So that then forced me to, to start looking at every library in the country to see who had a copy of this book. And there were five copies. Um, and again, this is during COVID. So many of these libraries are closed and their staff are you know, barely working. And I had to contact staff members in each one of those libraries to ask them, first of all, did they indeed have the book? Because I'd found out that a lot of times WorldCat isn't right. And it'll say that a library has a book and they really don't. Um, like the Library of Congress said to me, we don't have that book, even though it, it, you know, it says that they do. Um, and so uh, after finally getting in contact, then waiting for people to get back to me to say, yeah, I have the book and there's no picture. And then I had to confirm because I don't, you know, you never know if you trust anybody. At any rate, um, I found it in a very small library and um, at a small college in uh, Ohio. Um, I opened up my email one day and someone said, yes, we have this book. And I'm like, okay, great. And then I, I call her and she's actually in and willing to talk to me. And, and she says, yeah, there's a picture in it. Well, this is after two years. And so I'm like, what, what, <laughs> you have a picture? Um, and turns out that she had a picture and I'm like, well, can you send it to me? Thinking I'm asking the impossible because I needed to see it immediately. I didn't want to wait for the official thing. And she's like, yeah, no problem. This is the beauty of working with small libraries. Um, and she emails it and it is not the picture that I had seen digitized. So I was both thrilled and now I still have more work to do because there is a picture out there of her when she's younger um, that exists and you can barely see it. And it's from the Library of Congress version, supposedly, but they say they don't have it. Um, and, but this picture was in another edition. And um, I was, so that's how I found it. And so now I know that there are at least two pictures of her out there. And there's one picture that I've been looking for all this time that I still haven't figured out where it is um, <laughs> or if it still exists. Thank you. Um, so we have a question from uh, Dr. Joyce Moody who asks, any guesses about the content of the letters Elaw would have exchanged with her daughter? Um, my guess would be that I'm sure that she would talk about um, what was happening to her in each location. Um, so one of the things that you get a glimpse of in her narrative is a very snarky wit. Um, and so I can only imagine that as constrained as she was in writing within that genre and having to think about her audience, I can't even imagine what her personal letters would have been like, which is what, why I would love to get them. So I, I, I feel confident in saying that she would have said things to her daughter um, that she wouldn't have expressed elsewhere um, and certainly not publicly. So I feel like we would have got, we would get more context around actual conversations that she had, um, what her feelings were about people telling her uh, about what she couldn't do or where she shouldn't be or why she shouldn't do such and such. Um, I would imagine that, oh, I'm sure that she wrote about um, her, her marriage and that's a big mystery. Uh, we have no idea. Um, uh, why she, why she remarried at that, at that age? Um, because I mean, now 50 something isn't old, but at the time you were in the last chapter, you typically, unless you, you lived a much longer life, which she actually did, but that was atypical. So, you know, why she re remarried, she remarried, um, a white man of German descent, um, I would love to have read in those letters. I'm sure she would have talked about her relationship with his grown children, right? How did they receive that marriage? Um, and I just wanted, want to know a lot more about that marriage. So that I'm sure would have been in those letters. 
So I'm sure that she would have been talking about her day-to-day -day life. Um, and then also they shared a deep, uh, a deep connection around their faith. Um, and so I think that that would have been sort of mutual conversation around both of them growing spiritually and sort of where they were moment to moment um, in their spiritual lives. Can I jump in on this just for a second? I, I think you're the recovery of the relationship between mother and daughter that you provide really is another way that um, I think differently about this narrative. There's a sense of, you know, of, of abandonment if you read it alone, right? And, and also that that comes up as, you know, what, what, how, how are these women who are called to preach and are, are on the move a lot, how they relate to their children is a question across lots of these. And I just, I really loved, you know, learning more about their relationship from your research. Yeah, I'm sure it was, you know, very complex, right? Because we have lots of models throughout history of uh, this tension, right? Uh, of women needing to leave their children in order to do all the things. Um, and particularly when we're talking about women of color, right? Needing to go somewhere else to work and provide sustenance and get a, you know, have a better career or whatever it is. Um, and certainly in, in itinerant ministry. And, and what we know about those relationships is, you know, they run the gamut, but we know that they're always complex. Um, and so I'm sure that that level of complexity, that tension would also be in those letters. Um, so that even though, yes, I, I fully believe they had a very close relationship, um, there's no way that there wasn't some tension around the fact that they spent a good amount of uh, Rebecca, her daughter's life, a good amount of her life was spent away from her mother. So we have uh, maybe one more question here from, um, from the chat and it's from Kate Hodge. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, and the question is, when is the monograph coming out? Which <laughs> we are, we wanna recognize that we are in the moment of celebrating the edition and being able to pause and say, Kim, yay, <laughs> breathe, enjoy. Um, but we want to recognize how excited um, people are for your ongoing work. Um, and so thinking, I guess, about how, how um, do you see the relationship between the edition and the, the monograph being able to kind of take up, you know, things that, that you've, um, you've learned and wanted to expand on or, or you know, how that will inform um, the monograph. Thank you. Um, so, okay, so first things first, <laughs> um, my expectation, my hope, my desire um, uh, uh, about something over which I no longer have any control um, is that the, uh, the monograph will be coming out um, with Duke, hopefully, um, uh, I, I think the last communication was we're looking at um, uh, either the end of, of this, act, this year, 2022 or early 2023. Okay, so that's where we are now. Um, there were several significant sort of COVID delays um, with both uh, projects, both the edition and then uh, with the monograph, but things are moving along now. Um, and I very much, I had a lot of anxiety around the fact that there's more time than I would like between the, the two books. I had hoped that they would come out almost back to back because um, surely to your question, I did envision them as being um, sort of in partnership, right? They're standalone. You don't need um, to, to, to read the, the monograph on e-law in order to get what you need from the edition, right? Or to teach it. Um, but there's, what the, mon what the monograph does is to really look very closely at sort of the larger picture and the way in which I'm arguing that we need to look differently at the intersections of, of race and religion um, and gender um, during this very particular period. Um, and so I'm sort of repositioning 
um, e-law at the center of this inquiry, right? Because we, what we don't have, we have lots of books written about these things, but what we don't have is this look through this particular lens of this woman who wrote this uh, narrative that goes, you know, until 1845, which in and of itself is a fairly long period. Um, and as Judith, Judith pointed out, it's, it's more, it's bigger, right? The book itself is longer. Um, than other narratives that we have. But in addition to that, it geographically covers um, so much more space. Um, and so I really would like to see studies and scholarship on ELAW move in a direction of more context, um, more um, attention to the cultural work that her ministry uh, was doing. And then thinking through what kinds of questions do we come away with um, around um, the Second Great Awakening, right? Around the growth of Methodism, uh, both in the United States and in England. And I, I have to believe that she, she, there weren't like a whole lot of Black women running around preaching in, in England, um, but I already know she wasn't the only one. Um, she's, she's, as far as we know, she's the only one who wrote a book. Uh, but I already have evidence of at least one or two other uh, women. And so I'm hoping that it just opens up more questions and more inquiry ar around, you know, get, there are different ways of looking at these movements and the intersections if we look at it from the perspective of this black woman in the center rather than she's an exception and she sits on the outside. Can we get an amen for Kim today? <laughs> I mean, yes. So um, we are, we were, we're going to ask um, Kim, if you have any closing, I mean, I feel like that was, you know, any additional closing um, remarks or comments you would like to share with us um, as we, you know, celebrate here and continue to celebrate um, all that you have done and what you've brought us in this in this edition? Um, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna go full circle and go back to to gratitude. Um, you know, there, there were really extraordinary scholars um, who showed us how to do this work and more importantly, why this work was important, right? So why it was okay for me to spend a significant portion of my career, um, you know, looking to see what can I find out about this woman, right? Scholars who, who put this at the forefront. And, and just gave us a model, right, of how to how to focus ourselves as Black study scholars. Um, and I'm just really just so grateful because um, without that, without all of that work that came before, I mean, where would we be without Sisters of the Spirit? We wouldn't be having this conversation, right? Um, where would we be without Written by Yourself? <laughs> you know, we wouldn't, there are just so many models. Uh, and then moving forward, as, as Gabrielle mentioned, into, you know, folks who are, are um, still, you know, writing um, new, um, I just picked up a book, I'm sorry, I'm lost it, but I just picked up a book and I can't remember the name of the scholar right now, but uh, it just came out and I was so, again, I was like, oh, wow, this is exactly what I was thinking a few weeks ago. I need to know more about X. Oh, it was readings of Paul. Um, and then this book appears. So it's just, this is just a great time to be, to be doing this work. And I'm just really grateful for the scholars who are here today, um, the scholars who laid out the foundation for us um, and, this, and the scholars who will take this work and go so much further with it like Denise. So thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Um, so we, we wanted to say thank you to you again. Um, we wanna thank you for the attention and care that you have brought to Zilpha Elaw, to bringing her back from, you said, the, the, the back shelves of literary study um, and from the invisibilizing typography of her white male contemporaries to show us how this black visionary itinerant preacher claimed authority to write her own story. 
And we wanna also thank the panelists for being here, for their brilliance, their generosity. Um, we wanna say thank you to the family members. We know dad is here. Um, <laughs> we wanna say thank you um, to all of the scholars who are here, Francis Smith Foster. It's so many, I don't wanna start naming, so I'm not gonna do that, but you know, there's so many who are here and who have paved the way. Um, thank you to the CBDR team, Kevin, Gabby, Daphne, um, and the entire center. When people are doing the work, there's people in the background who are doing other kinds of work. So thank you to everyone. Um, and we also want to give a special thank you to uh, Dr. Gabrielle Foreman, who um, wouldn't let this moment go by without making us stop and celebrate. And it really is important to have people in your corner who remind you that the work you're doing is important and to stop and to cherish it and to celebrate it. And so with that, we want to um, ask everybody if they can raise a glass. I made, so I tried to make a fancy drink. I did something, I did something over here. <laughs> I, don't I don't know what it is, I did something. <laughs> So that we can raise a glass um, in celebration of Dr. Blockett and an appreciation to the communities gathered here today that remind us to come together to cherish and celebrate each other, our work and our lives and those who have made this work possible for us. Cheers. Thank you all. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you everyone so much for joining us. Um, Please, I wish we could all just, just unmute, but, but please feel free to drop your notes in the chat, anything um, you wanna say and, um, and get the book and let's keep talking about it. This is the beginning of the conversation. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you everyone.